Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, uh, my dear colleagues. I'm really glad to be here in this uh, conference and present uh, my uh, not only university but also country. Uh, continuing the previous speakers' uh, talk about uh, culture identities, culture references, uh, I will speak about uh, not mythology, not folk tales, but about one of the most uh, impressive American uh, story writers, novel writers, John Grisham, and his novels. Uh, but if uh, I mention John Grisham in uh, the public, usually people think about uh, uh, criminal stories because he was a lawyer in uh, his life before he started to write the things. But I have taken another part that is culture and culture references, but culture, what he is representing, American culture. Um, and uh, I will try to speak about um, uh, identification of cultural references in my uh, story here and translator's approach because one thing is that uh, we read the story, yeah, and um, that was also the continuation of our uh, Professor Cronin's uh, talk, yeah, that uh, people not always read the original, how they can get this. They read translations and it depends on translator. It's translator's fault or success whether we perceive this uh, depicted culture perfectly. And then uh, I figured out that there are two um, uh, basic things. What we do with those culture references? One thing is that we realize them, but the other thing is how we deal with them and how a translator uh, gets along with this. Yeah. So either uh, to foreignize this culture reference or domestic case. Yeah. So uh, give the some other kind of version. There were some kind of translations already mentioned in the previous talk by uh, um, Alexandra. But uh, I have sorted them out and made kind of uh, a scheme of, of these things. So here a little bit uh, about the basic. I took the, as a source text uh, John Grisham's novel The Pelican Brief and its translation in Latvian, uh, Pelican Lieta. I hope, yeah, that's fine. Uh, and as you see the numbers here in the original, there were spotted about 329 culture-specific lexical units and only 273 found in the um, corresponding Latvian text. Yeah, uh, The difference is between uh, these numbers because the author, uh, the, the translator, has used a lot the case of omissions and I will speak about that also later. Uh, well, to start with, I wanted also to say that how do we define these cultural references? What are these? And I found the Alx uh, definition for that very nice and therefore I'm using that as well. Uh, lexical units in the source text which at a given point in time refer to objects or concepts which do not exist in a specific target culture or which deviate in their cultural textual function significantly in denotation or connotation from lexical equivalence unable in the target culture and uh, my goal was here to identify these culture specific lexical items which could pose problems in a translation of the text into target language but take into account that it's a uh, nowadays modern text and most usually people are taken away by the plot not so much about culture references but those who have visited um, uh, United States those who are acquainted with uh, American culture sometimes can and really become in shock what has been done with uh, translation of these things. Uh, for the analysis of the following, uh, I said that I have created a framework and here seven main things are transference, this culture uh, reference could be transferred as a cultural item. Then uh, transference plus explicitation or transference with explanation. Target language expression referring to the source culture. Uh, neutral explanation and omission and sometimes it's substitution of a culture reference with a cultural equivalent that is known to the target uh, audience reader. And now about each of them in short. Uh, by transference, we understand that it's instances where a culture-specific item from the source text is transferred into target text uh, 
straight direct forward. Uh, sometimes it's called also direct transference. And here I'd like to mention uh, the um, examples, let's say Indians, and it's uh, one part of American culture, in war paint, yeah, and that was connected, uh, uh, translated very precisely, cow is krasas. I'm sorry, you may not uh, know, and uh, translators can't uh, translate Latvian, yeah? But believe me, that's word to word what it is. And then full battle dress, yeah? So exactly the same thing was uh, uh, translated, and therefore it's counted as real uh, direct transference examples. Now, if we speak about the next uh, choice, that is transference plus explicitation. In these cases of explicitation, translators expand the target text, building into it a semantic redundancy absent in the original, as if to trying to explain the things. For example, uh, here uh, the original sentence is in italics, but think, and there is mark where in Latvian something is added, of the violence and the radicals, and the ten sentence goes on. But in this part, yeah, uh, there is added, uh, think about those which uh, sponsor or support and then goes the translation. And, these, okay, and in this case, it changes the uh, uh, meaning of the original text. Uh, if we speak about the next, that is transference plus explanation, uh, that is a very uh, many cases when it's used, it's used with, in connection with folk texts, with um, um, texts of 18th, 19th century when they are translated, but not with the modern ones. Uh, and here, uh, when a cultural explanation is transferred like this, uh, it has the notative meaning explained in the target text. And this is categorized as transference with explanation. Sometimes um, this uh, explanation explicitly acknowledged and underlines the conceptual foreignness of the item. Uh, usually, in these cases, glosses and explanations are uh, added as literal translation, generic de definition, or comparison with some cultural uh, equivalent, in order to make the uh, target text more understandable for the target audience. Now, and here are some uh, examples also. He signed off with a patented grandfather's smile of complete trust and wisdom and reassurance. And in the Latvian, uh, that is also um, added this um, underlined space, but it naturally comes in because in English sometimes we say a participle with ing at the end or ed at the end, those uh, uh, past participles that in our, in my language, in Latvian language, we have to use some kind of uh, subordinate clause to explain these things. Um, well, then if we speak about target language expression referring to the source culture, uh, that is also um, quite difficult because this category comprises those translations in which a cultural reference is not transferred but replaced by a word or phrase in the target language, which is, uh, which is still rooted in this, uh, that on the source culture. Um, uh, to step aside a little bit, this method is very uh, much used when, uh, for example, uh, Simpsons were translated into Latvian, yeah? all those subtitles. Uh, that is, uh, I heard today the colleague mentioning, yeah? and uh, that is uh, devil's work to do uh, that with translation. One word and there lays a lot of facts and, and uh, history behind it. Uh, and here uh, I have found also some examples, let's say lightweights in English, but uh, in Latvian it was translated as nothing special, yeah? uh, although if you look in the dictionary that lightweights in this plural uh, meaning only with exclamation mark at the end really means that it's nothing special, yeah? so you are too light to fight for that. Uh, and also uh, there was uh, the same thing about smelled blood, yeah? Uh, that is uh, characteristic for a very cruel business world, very cruel political fights and all these things. Um, quite uh, characteristic culture reference that was uh, mentioned with this Sayuta Asins, really, uh, direct translation. But uh, the thing is referred uh, usually to political affairs and political activities of United States. 
in Latvian uh, literature. Uh, the neutral explanation uh, is that which, br which brings honor and success for the uh, translator. If translator has hit the target with only one word to one word or, or a phrase to phrase, but it comes logical and it's uh, nothing added, nothing taken away, and it's a neutral translation. Uh, for example, here, um, the translator used w for word wizard, word master's masters, and uh, I found this uh, translation really what it means. It carries a whole uh, semantic meaning in it, and its wording uh, sounds there perfect. And then also, said slowly in a perfect generic American tongue. Here, Anglu, yeah, that means English, could be substituted with American, but then in English, in English version, it could be said American English, yeah. So, but there it is uh, translated like that. Uh, and there comes uh, the next thing, omission, that I have found in most cases why this difference is between the uh, these lexical units. Um, deliberately omitted reference is counted as omission and it's very difficult sometimes to find uh, because uh, the structure of languages are difficult, different. And when you translate, sometimes the sentence structure may um, cover this omission. But if you read the semantically analyzing the text, then of course omission pops out. And uh, here I uh, even sorted out, yeah, because that is the most cases uh, used uh, um, translation structure. Uh, four different types: an omission of a word, yes, yellow nylon ski rope, and in Latvian there is nothing of ski, but the ski rope it's a special type of rope, yes, uh, draft beer. And there exist also different types of other beers, but that was exactly draft beer that is sold in pubs, yeah, so, and uh, bound into a, a fatal position, so, Pasha Sase, so, it was bound, and that's it, no, uh, no telling how, in what way, and, uh, and so. Then, an omission of a phrase, yeah, uh, stroke food, the main um, character in this episode has survived a uh, stroke and he has been uh, a uh, assigned a special diet. So here only in Latvian it's uh, encountered what uh, he has, not mentioning the stroke food. The words missing, uh, of course you miss a lot of the person's life, stroke survival. Uh, then uh, the third is an, an omission of a sentence, and that sometimes uh, is um, also um, telling that uh, translation won't reveal finally the whole message of the author of the source text. Uh, as a last one, an omission of several sentences that was really, uh, I think, um, uh, neglecting uh, activity on translator's part in this case. And uh, by the way, the last two uh, types of omission led me to contact the translator of the novel, uh, because Grecian novels in Latvian have been translated by four different uh, authors uh, and, and translators. And it turned out that uh, the lady who translated, she has never been in the United States and she has no idea about these things. The only thing I asked her, why didn't you check some kind of, uh, uh, let's say, Google or, or, or uh, some other kind of sources? And so, uh, that tells what we have to pay attention when we are instructing and teaching uh, our uh, future translators. Uh, so, and the last thing uh, is um, here cultural substitution. Uh, that is when the things used in, in um, the target language are made closer or, or are transferred to that culture what uh, the reader is uh, belonging to. Uh, and uh, here, um, we will never understand in Latvian a towering legend, but in English, in American English, tower is already something big, yeah, and something great, outstanding. So in Latvian has been found uh, really a uh, nice, uh, how to say, uh, substitute, unique, unicals, yeah. So also, no downside, uh, also, that uh, was um, 
very good uh, finding of the uh, translator. And re-election, uh, in my country, re-elections happen once in 20, 25 years, yeah? So usually there is election and that's done. But uh, in United States, I know that uh, there are re-elections and, re and, and uh, the second term uh, servicing and so, yeah? Therefore, it's, uh, it could be uh, par violations, yeah? So in Latvian, we have the name for this, but there is not used for. And again, it's missing even in uh, time, uh, uh, depiction, yeah, let's say, uh, if the president, and uh, according to uh, his speech, his dress style, I figured out that uh, in that uh, novel they are speaking about uh, John, uh, Bill Clinton. So, uh, the translation um, could be um, indicated also in another uh, field, that is, if we would like to preserve the exotism, or uh, we would like to explain this exotism, uh, or uh, the text uh, could be left uh, neutral, or uh, it could be uh, moved to tran cultural transplantation. And let's look what it is. If we put two uh, cultural systems together, as we understand, it's the source culture, target culture, and then there exists some common ground in between. I tried hard to make a scheme of that, yeah? And then if you look here, one circle is this uh, source culture, the other circle is target culture, and in between that oval makes this co uh, common ground. And if we look at this uh, uh, exotism, it belongs really to source culture, yeah? Cultural transplantation to target culture. And then explained exotism and neutralism, it partly is there, partly is there, more to the common ground. And you, if you look in the third uh, row, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, yeah, these case, cases, I discussed now uh, just uh, how the author has used them, the translator has used them, and how I, as a reader, saw them, yeah? So, and you, transference, transference plus, uh, plus exploitation, transference plus explanation, they belong more to source culture. Source culture is transferred. And here, uh, again, target culture, what is good for reader? Omission, cultural substitution. Not always, yeah? And in between, that's neutral or a target language expression referring to the source culture. And that leads us to conclusions that translation of cultural references are used to identify foreignization or domestication tendencies in the translator's approach to handling the cultural load of a text. Or one of the main issues in the analysis of cultural references translations lies in the reliable identification of cultural references, which is to some extent an intuitive and therefore subjective process. The difference in the number between the culture-specific lexical units in both compared languages appears due to great number of omission used by the translator. And then I would like to... Uh, yeah, there is also about uh, four types of omission, yeah? A word, a phrase, the sentence, and several sentences. And translation of cultural references is used to identify foreignization or domestication tendencies in the translation's approach of handling. I have copied also the first double time. I'm sorry. Thanks for attention. I hope I... I, I <laughs>